I'm going to talk about really the afterlife of Kevin Barry and his memorialization because I find it very, very intriguing indeed. Uh, on a cold October day in, a, in a 2001, I, I went a, as a guest to the state funeral for the Mountjoy 10. And frankly, I went in, the, the weather was miserable and I was very skeptical as to the amount of public interest in the event. And I was completely surprised by the attendance and thousands who thronged the streets waiting, even though the official ceremonies ran way over time. Uh, but it was very clear from both that the crowd, crowd on the street and the newspaper coverage that as far as people were concerned, there was a state funeral for 10 people, Kevin Barry and nine others, most of whose names were unknown to the crowd around. And not mentioned in newspaper coverage unless it was they were of local interest in an area. So the question is, why does Kevin Barry have such a prominent position in the Irish memory and what really does it mean? And looking through the newspaper coverage at the time, I was struck by a story of the Irish Independent around that time which noted that despite the prominence given to him, most of us know nothing about, a, very little about this teenage gunman as they described him. And in many ways, I would argue that Kevin Barry was something of a palimpsest. The fact that his story is in many, his personal story is quite short, uh, means that he becomes a figure on which you can superimpose uh, images that are of importance two people in remembering the War of Independence and the events of that second decade uh, of the 20th century. I mean, he does have obvious significance. He's the first person to be executed by the British after the 1916 leaders, and that gives him a certain a real status. He's the first martyr of the next phase of the struggle for independence. He's young, he's photogenic, He's generally pictured in his sports jersey. He went to a Jesuit school, a public school, you might call it in English terms. And he's the complete antithesis to the murder gang, which is the image that the British were trying to portray at the time of the man. Uh, but there were other youth figures as well who'd ever made it beyond the old surrounds. I'm thinking of Con Colbert and people like that. Their names really do not, do not resonate at all. Um, and the other interesting thing is when you look at the memorabilia for Kevin Barry, they don't really link him back into 1916. He is definitely a clean brick from 1916 in many ways, and he's looked at separately. Uh, the linkages they tend to draw are with Robert Emmett. He's the, 21st, he's the 20th century Robert Emmett, for example, as well. The other linkage that, of course, is critical is Terence McSweeney. Uh, they probably never met in life, but they have been really linked together very much in depth. Um, because Barry is executed within days of McSweeney dying on hunger strike and the standoffs that, uh, that, that were associated with the McSweeney funeral. What that meant, of course, was that the international media were focused on Ireland and Barry, in a sense, becomes part of that wider story. His death was widely covered in the, new, in the US newspapers. New York Times, for example, covers uh, the, the vigil on the eve of his execution and the actual execution, and the British papers covered it very extensively as well. And again, in terms of timing, um, October, November, and particularly November, he's, he's executed in the first, 1920, marks the end of what you could term the phony war stage of the War of Independence. Uh, things get really, really nasty and dramatic following from there. So he comes in at that particular stage and you get the widespread media descriptions. You could almost say they went viral of the, ex of the vigil outside Mount Joy, the thousands of women particularly who were there. And this is a story that traveled very extensively. Then there's also the poems. There's, there's actually quite a good minor collection of them that you could, that you could brought, bring together, including one by Constance Markovics. And then of course, there are the songs, including the marching song of the Republic, Kevin Barry to the tune of John Brown. And then of course, there is the famous ballad. And the ballad is interesting. It wasn't commissioned. It comes up from below. It, 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 comes, from, it, it comes from outside. And, and it seems to be of Scottish and English origin. And one of the features of Kevin Barry that I'd like to highlight is Kevin Barry and the diaspora, because he 
does resonate there at quite an early stage in, in, the, in, in the whole picture. I mean, the National Library holds a brochure published in Buenos Aires in 1921 titled Our Boy Martyr. A, one interesting thing is he was a university student, but he's often made even younger than he was, a schoolboy or boy in this case. And this in Buenos Aires, a victim of Britishism in Ireland. You get branches of the American Agent Order for Burnings in the States. You get various others who adopt the Kevin Barry name. He's helped by the fact that the Irish are on a global mission at this stage. You've got Mary McSweeney speaking tours. You've got Harry Bond, De Valera, and many others in the States. And so they're promulgating the Kevin Barry story. As, as part of their rhetoric. So he gets very, very much is a, into, into a prominent position in the Irish martyrology. And as I said, the linkage with McSweeney is important. There's also, there's an interesting brochure in the National Library as well of a St. Patrick's Day event in San Antonio, Texas in the 1920s, where they enacted some form of, I think, two person drama. Uh, there were songs and everything as well, called The Soul of Ireland. And the manhood is typified by the Lord Mayor McSweeney, as they call him, and Ireland in her womanhood by the mother of Kevin Barry on the eve of his execution. So she becomes a kind of a successor to Mrs. Pierce, and, and she becomes successor to Mrs. Pierce and is treated accordingly. Uh, the ballad really does help, even though, um, uh, you know, uh, um, if, even though it might be seen as a cliche because the song survived across the decades. Uh, many people probably didn't know who he was, but they knew that this was a patriotic song. It was played almost mandatorily at Irish dance halls in Britain and in the United States into the 60s and probably beyond. And many of the young dancers who danced to that probably didn't know much about him except the name. He becomes shorthand for the Irish Revolution. Uh, I was struck by a comment I, that I read yesterday on passant uh, about Billy Fox, who was the Fine Gael uh, TD who, who was assassinated in the 1970s. And he talked about having both the, sh the sash and Kevin Barry, and they're both shorthands for political stances, which is quite significant. And I want to end with a final twist of the Kevin Barry story, which is the 2001 funeral because that was used by the Irish government to symbolize the 21st century Ireland, the post Good Friday Agreement Ireland, and the speeches on that day, the sermon by Cahal Daly in the Pro Cathedral and the speech by Bertie Ahern, both signaled that the armed struggle of the Northern crisis was consigned to history. And furthermore, that the old IRA war of independence could once again be commemorated. And Bertie Ahern used this event, which is linked with Kevin Barry's name to re-engage the Irish state with, with the a decade of independence and the large crowds who turned out that day and as I said I was quite skeptical about it before it happened um, showed that there was popular interest in the heroes and indeed heroines of that period and, uh, and the events uh, and this, this state funeral with Kevin Barry in standing in starring role can be seen as marking the first steps to what became the decade of centenaries and the embrace by the Irish state of, of, of the commemorative movement. <laughs>